We are recording. Nick Allen, Dr. Nick Allen, Dr. Nick Allen. Yeah. Welcome back. Welcome back. Good to see you, um, Yeah, good to see you too. Good to see you too. I thought it was a bit longer since we last, since we last, it wasn't, it was about 18 months ago, like you said. Something like that. Yeah. Um, what's happening in the crypto world? I should, I should actually, I should actually just caveat this with if anyone is stepping into this and going, crypto? What the fuck? Yeah. Go back to the previous Nick Alvin episode where Nick very kindly gave us a high level of all of the key things that may pop into your mind when you think crypto, including scam and including Web3. Um, that's a good start point if you're clueless. If you're not, then uh, enjoy this episode. So, yeah, crypto world. What's happening in crypto world? Things don't look great at the minute. If you just look at the Bitcoin value, as the, which is the mark everyone goes to. Yeah. I mean, it's not doing too bad on in terms of Bitcoin price, if you like. It's not a million miles away from its all-time highs. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of, I think we're about 50-something K at the moment. We're just kind of, we've mostly been going sideways for quite a long time. But it's in the fallout of a kind of big market crash. So I think the last time we spoke, it was all kind of going pretty swimmingly. Everyone thought, you know, the Web3 year is coming. Um, and it turned out there was a huge amount of kind of systemic risk bottled up into the industry. What what was that risk? The risk was a guy called Sam Bankman Freed, for the <laughs> most part. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, <clears throat> I didn't like this guy at the time. There was, I mean, there was, it, there was a few different players that kind of blew up and it caused this kind of big cascading failure across the industry. Um, so SPF's gone to trial now. You know, it turned out... We didn't talk about him last time, did we? I don't think so. I don't think so. Keep talking. I'm just going to double check when that last episode was. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's check the timeline because um, I can't remember if it was before and after that event because that was the big, big event, basically. So, you know, crypto goes through these cycles, right, where it kind of, it's very cyclical, it's very volatile. Anyone who's been in crypto for a long time, like myself, is kind of used to it. Um, but typically what happens is we, it kind of gets very hot, gets overblown, prices get overvalued, and then it, it kind of snaps back to its true value. And that can be quite quick and volatile action that happens. This one was particularly bad. Um, <clears throat> because a lot of people essentially put their money into an exchange, centralized exchange run by Sam Bankman Freed. And he'd been spending everyone's money. So people have been putting their money into an exchange and he was literally just spending it like it was his. <clears throat> so he, he piled it into a lot of in investments. He took out massive loans on cryptocurrencies that people thought had value but didn't it was before the last time so the sam bank god this is how long ago it was sorry to interrupt yeah the sam bankman freed so ftx crashed november 2022 yeah we did our first chat together episode 203 april 2023 i april, i, I yeah. think i'm sitting to remember it was one of the reasons that we we got in on it okay yeah okay. yeah so that was around the time so i think that might have even before one of the big stable coins went down which was called UST, um, which is built on this blockchain called Luna. Again, another kind of crypto villain character called Do Kwon. Essentially got everyone convinced that this cryptocurrency they'd made UST was a stable coin. Uh, it was an algorithmic stable coin, which basically meant it's not backed by real dollars or anything, but it was pegged to the dollar. Um, and that was kind of all held together by um, kind of arbitrage. So people would like, if it fell below the price of a dollar, people would buy it up to a dollar. How could you ensure that people buy it though? Well, just the incentives are there, right? If the, if the, if it's a dollar, I mean, this is why it failed because ultimately people didn't. Um, but yeah, the idea is basically a lot of these stable coins are held together by essentially arbitrage games. So if it falls below the, you know, the, the rational price for this asset is a dollar. If it falls to 95 cents, you're basically making 5% free if you just buy it up and it'll repeg. And ultimately that, that went down because it was what was called, uh, it's endogenous collateral. So that the collateral that was backing the stable coin was another cryptocurrency. 
So it wasn't backed by real dollars. So there's there's other stable coins in the space which are backed by um, <coughs> actual dollars. So there's like USDC, Tether. It just come out today, made more profit than BlackRock last year. Absolutely, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, they've started buying. Like they bought this week, they bought ten percent of like an agriculture. Are they more company made reserve. more profit percentage wise or actual more hard profit. Cash? Like really? they, they t- like made seven billion in profit last year, and they've started. Essentially, they're they're a kind of more like a fund now. So essentially, what happens is people buy these stable coins because they want to not be exposed to the volatile world of Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these sort of things. So you, a lot of people hold stable coins. In fact, stable coins are like probably the killer app of crypto at the moment, used heavily in places like India. Um, and there's like hundreds of billions of dollars being held in these stable coins. So essentially, you put your money into a bank and they issue you a, a sort of digital dollar. And then they go and take that money and put it into things like US treasuries and, and, and invest it, basically. Um, and people have long thought this was the dodgy one, that Tether at some point was going to blow up, but it's kind of tidied itself up and professionalized over the years and, and actually now a very profitable business. There's another one called USDC, which is an American-based one, run by a company called Circle. And these are like fully backed by real assets. Um, and they have to have a certain amount of like liquid capital. So everyone sort of runs for it. Um, and, and USDC did depeg for a bit when Silicon Valley Bank went down. So two, two banks went down in America and all the dollars held in the bank were inaccessible. And so people were trying to get out of USDC over the weekend and it depegged to about 85 cents. Um, essentially those banks kind of got bailed out and it repegged and everything went fine. But UST wasn't backed by sort of any real assets at all, really. Um, and that went completely to zero. And there was tens of billions of dollars tied up in this system. Uh, they got wiped out in overnight. A lot of people lost a lot of money on it. Uh, and that was the kind of cascade. That's how Sam Bankman Free got found out, basically. Because he was, I mean, I, he was involved in that in some way. He, I think he was thinking, he, he was definitely involved in trying to topple some of these actors in the space because he oh. wanted to buy it all, basically. So what happened was UST depegged. This wiped out a whole load of the Asian market. Like uh, the uh, South Korea was very heavily into Luna because um, it was kind of from that sort of region, um, and it wiped out like whole funds, lost billions of dollars because um, it was so attractive. You could basically hold this UST and get twenty percent APY on it, twenty percent return, and you could stake it and lever it up, and people were like printing money on it. For a long time and because it was a stable coin everyone thought it was super safe um turned out not to be and and kind of went to zero and then that left huge holes in balance sheets of lots of different places so ftx went down like several months after this but a lot of um a lot of other companies like celsius uh block there was a lot of companies that sort of emerged on the market promising to take your crypto and give you good yield on it. Like, if you give me your Bitcoin, um, I'll give you 15% yield, 20% yield, you know, like bank busting rates, basically. So a lot of, lot of people put their money in that thing. Um, and yeah, I didn't, I never touch any of these things. I don't put my money in any centralized venues because I don't trust them. Um, but <clears throat> a lot of people did. And really behind the scenes, they were just taking this money and then gambling with it, essentially. Um, playing the market in DeFi, where you could, you know, stake Ethereum. And, you know, Ethereum is a proof of stake asset. So you can stake it, get yield on it, um, which is much safer and, and essentially a core part of that ecosystem now. Um, but what these guys were doing was taking all this money and then doing all these leverage trading like complex trades. Um, and when UST went down, they all started to unwind. Um, 
and what was making you know 15 20 30 percent and they were keeping all the profits all of a sudden went to zero and then there was bank runs one after the other so people started taking the money out of these things um and then eventually they were like oh you can't take your money out um <coughs> Celsius had this kind of huddle mode activated, they said, basically, which is like, you you can't take your money out. So everyone started to panic. And that's when everyone started to take their money out of these centralized venues. Um, and SPF in particular, he he knew at this point that he had a hole in his balance sheet. Like he didn't have, if everyone took their money out of FTX, he didn't have enough money to cover it. But he started to double down. And he started buying these now defaulted things like BlockFi. He was like buying them for like hundreds of millions, things like that. And it, so he was kind of trying to show the market confidence. I've still got the money. Um, you can tell because I'm still investing big. You know, I'm, I'm still um, sponsoring football stadiums and all of this sort of stuff. So it was kind of like a confidence game. But in reality, he had $10 billion missing inside mm -hmm. this thing. Um, and then things started to cascade, prices were going down, and then at some point the balance sheet for FTX came out and a lot of their assets were loans that they'd taken out on cryptocurrencies that weren't worth basically anything. Like he'd managed to get billions of dollars of loans on these cryptocurrencies that actually weren't very liquid and weren't worth that much. And then as soon as that balance sheet came out, everyone panicked, took all the money out, and then it all went bomb. What about what about the... I'm just realising now, you obviously know a lot more about it now since we last talked, because so much more information has been become available. Um, what about the... On that 10 billion that was missing, the allegation that he was basically funneling that into his own... for his own means and projects and personal use outside of what was this implied intent yeah. for that money. So he was backdooring it out. Yeah, he was like this basically all came out in a court of law. He was definitely doing this. So that he you know, there was money being taken out of the exchange and he was buying like mansions in in the Bahamas and um and actually it all came out and there was this kind of like rat's nest of shell companies that he built, yeah. like 150 of these like circular shell companies. It was like, actually it wasn't really crypto, any of this stuff. It was basically traditional finance. This is one of the things I explain to people who, who um, either, you know, in conversation have a real scathing view of crypto, inverted commas, yeah. and um, and will reference things like, this yes I, I i point out is you're not what 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 is happening is this is a layer over the technology yeah and it's a layer over the technology in exactly the same way as a um you know banks are a layer over uh fiat cash yes you know it's like it's it, it people are people are not being as the the, the control measures and the and the control measures not in place and the regulations not in place in order to get Crypto companies, you know these these middlemen, yeah. as as a higher quality as what banks are these days. Yes, and there's still a risk with banks. Banks collapse. Yeah, just and 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 you get not good individuals running banks and other financial institutions, and things go pear shit. Yeah, just not very often because it's been around for so much longer. Yeah, you know this is this is the mistake. People are being a lot more liberal with their money. Investors and corporations in investing into crypto things and individuals as well, and then yeah. they get fucking rugged. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's this is the thing. I like the centralized venues. I think should be regulated exactly like um, traditional venues are. And some bank and Freed managed to kind of like get away with not regulating like a bank, behaving like a bank, but not regulating by like a bank because it was crypto assets that he was holding. <coughs> but yeah, really, it was this centralized layer on top of the blockchains that was created. That was ultimately the big scam in the end. There is scams, on chain scams in crypto. And perhaps talk about what they might look like, but, um, yeah, it was layers of like, Sam was 
a very traditional Wall Street guy. You know, he's straight out of the, you know, trading desk scene, Wall Street. Um, very much crypto noob, didn't really understand it in the end. And that became very obvious. And he, he was exceptionally good at things like arbitrage, you know, and there was lots of like very, you know, illiquid, inefficient markets in crypto. So it was a, for him, it was a really good way to make like loads of money very quickly. Um, and yeah, we tend to do this in crypto. These characters turn up and we sort of like lionize them into these like, oh, Sam's going to make everything better and take crypto into the promised land. And, all, and they always turn out to be scammers. Well, the, the, the DJ and actors step into the space, aren't they really? That's yeah. a, a Wall Street mindset is always going to be that kind of way, right? Correct, correct yeah. Or wrong. And I mean, he managed to scam some big, the, so the Sequoia, Capital, one of the biggest funds in the world, put three hundred million dollars into FTX, invested in it, um, and it was super embarrassing for them because they like wrote all these really gushy blog posts about how he's such an amazing founder, and <laughs> and really what they were looking at is like, oh look, here's a Wall Street guy who's come in to do this properly. Like none of these crypto people actually know how to make a business or make real money. This guy does, and actually it was complete opposite. He was the biggest scammer of all. Right. Um, and so, yeah, since we last spoke, we've just had this huge, the whole year was just things blowing up one after the other. And they were all the centralized projects. Like all the way through this, all the DeFi stuff kept working. Like in particular, I mentioned the USDC DPEG. Um, my bank for years has been a project called MakerDAO, which is a, a DAO, right? It's governed in a, by an on-chain governance mechanism. And this thing has its own stable coin. It's pegged to the dollar, uh, called DAI. And that's backed by Ethereum and other stable coins. And now things like US Treasuries, it's getting more into the meat space reality. But yeah, MakerDAO was open over the weekend. So in, like when USDC depegged, you couldn't redeem it via circle because a, the bank they were the holding the money. Circle. Circle's the company that runs USD, okay. USDC. And they run on the tr traditional banking system and it's shut at five o'clock. <laughs> right. And the Silicon Valley Bank, you know, announced it was, had gone bust at like 4.30 on a Friday. And everyone started selling it over the weekend. So it, it all depegged. You couldn't redeem it because the bank was shut. But yeah, make it out literally never shuts. So people, that did accept the the USDC off people in return for DAI. Um, and yeah, these systems are decentralized, so they they they're all transparent, right? So if FTX was actually a DeFi, actually a crypto project, you would have been able to see inside the treasury and realize actually it was all under collateralized. Um, in fact, you wouldn't have been able to do it in the first place. And this is the big promise of decentralized finance, in my view, because actually you can actually see inside the banks, if you like. You can see what's in the treasury. You can go to make it down and look at all these dashboards and see exactly how much collateral is in it, exactly what it's backed by. Yeah, yeah. Um, isn't it isn't it crazy to think that uh, the bank system still is on a nine to five half day on a Saturday system it, right now? It, it is just wild. wild. And it's kind of mad you can't really see inside them. And they all banks make money just like FTX did, which is leveraging up on user deposits and making money on it. Um, and yeah, if people all ran to the hate door of HSBC all of a sudden decided to take the money out, something like FTX would happen because they don't have the money. You know, it's not people's money aren't actually in the banks. They're tied up in other assets and they only have X amount that's, you know, withdrawable at any one time. And we don't really know how much they're fractionalized a lot of the time. So there's systems like FTX out there that we just don't know. You know, we don't know which one it is yet. It's a concern, isn't it, when you? I think when you're talking about problems like that, people problems, human factor, yeah, and uh, and that you know Wall Street attitude sort of factor. When when you consider that CBDC, a CBDC in the UK is going to yeah. be a reality at some time in the very near future, yeah, and and that by the very nature of government is going to have a layer over it over that you know what is going to be a blockchain technology have a, have a layer and assuming the, the design is decent it's going to have a layer over it of 
the bureaucracy and people and the pol- political side and civil servant side of yep. the government there either running it well or running it or not and, and it having a huge impact on, on people in a positive or, or negative way. That's a big concern, I think. I'm very concerned about CBDCs because I, I know what you can do with blockchain technology and um, it opens the door to ways of do- handling money and programming money and adding permissions to money in ways that you know you can't do with cash right and and actually it's a very it, it could be a very centralizing force because essentially what you're doing is doing business directly with the central bank in fact it'll probably will you know crypto we all talk talked about like toppling the banks it's actually cbdc's that'll topple the banks you think yeah Can you explain it to you why, why is that because it essentially disintermediates them right so banks are actually quite decentralized. You know, there's meant, there's quite a large amount yeah. of, there's, there's, there's a banking market, right? And they're in competition with each other for, for rates and services and products and all this sort of stuff. And that creates quite a healthy market. And the CBDCs, you're just doing business. You will literally just be depositing your money back into the central bank directly rather than going through these agents in the middle. Um, and so that's quite a large centralizing force, right? Well, I, I'm, I'm more worried about the privacy elements of it. Um, you will, there's a, you, largely they want cash out of the market, right? There's, when times are getting tough, you know, um, debt's getting high, costs are spiraling, complexity's going up, you know, we have, Things like pandemics that like cost loads of money and we have to like get the money back. So, uh, you know, everything the Labour government doing now, talking about ramping taxes to cover black holes and all these sort of things, right? Um, cash is a problem because there's an economy that the, the governments don't see, right? There's the whole load of money flow that you don't know, um, exactly how much money is moving around. It's people can avoid taxes with it. Um, so they want it gone, right? And, um, CBDCs are part of this, you know, move away from that. Because once, once you can see all the money flow, then, um, you can bet, you can do more granular monetary policy. So you can do more fine grained rate hikes and, um, you can see the monetary velocity in the system so you can know if there's inflation emerging sooner and you get all these superpowers that you haven't had before. Um, and it really empowers central banks to be able to do fine-grained monetary policy and all this sort of stuff. Um, so really getting rid of cash. I mean, and I don't use cash that much these days. You know, I'm pretty much all in Apple Pay. Um, but the... When it comes to CBDCs, if I wanted to send you so much as fifty pounds, I would have to say why I'm sending it to you. Like I can't give you a fifty pound note anymore, and say, "Oh, I'm sending this money to Hugh, and this is why." Right? And they get very fine-grained data on all the financial transactions, and that data is incredibly valuable. And they won't not be able to use it. Right? Yeah. They're, they're like, "Well, it's we've got to use it because." we'll be able to catch criminals with it. You know, we'll be able to spot where all the drug dealers are and we'll be able to spot, you know, it's unethical for us not to. So that they'll, they'll just have to, right? So that they'll have to use this for surveillance because the data is there. Um, and that's before you get into kind of like the programmability elements um, where you can like li- literally limit where money is spent, you know, so you could potentially give out benefits to people and say you can only spend it in Tesco or approved stores and things like that. Or even on certain products. Or so, or, yeah, certain yeah. products, you know, and like, and then that becomes a lobbying game on, on who those are and who's on the whitelist and who's not. And, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a potentially an attack on democracy generally, right? Yeah. It's, um, it's very worrying. We shouldn't rush into it. Um, anyone who does launch them over the next few years will probably end up unwinding them. Um, because technologically, we we can't really do them. Um, they're just very centralized. They're not even blockchains, right? They're just um, centrally controlled databases. Can you pause there? I need to change this battery. And, yep. Uh, back on. Excuse me, guys. I press record at the book.
Right, so can we pick up from, yeah, you were saying that uh, you think that the early CBDCs that are deployed will, will basically roll back or, or fail pretty quickly. That surprises me. Well, it's, it's kind of the technological systems, right? So it's like rolling out MySpace and expecting it to be to work forever, right? It's, um, these things will have to upgrade. And then you'll get into all this complexity around interoperability with these things. So they have to integrate across many systems and they'll realize that just like the, the, the first generation of these things, we've made a load of mistakes. We'll have to sort of reboot them again. Yeah, but I feel like in classic, like government sense, they, they would just plow on with it. If they had any, if they have any sense, they'll start off with something really small. They'll deploy something, you know, they'll deploy a technology, but they use it to administrate. That's what they're going to use it for. Yeah. Something really small, like a, and it'll tie in with some new benefit, universal basic income, for example. Yeah. As an example. Could be you. I, I think they'll pay the government employees with it first. You know, we, you know, I don't know, 15, 20% of the com country is employed by the government in some yeah. capacity. But you can so, imagine the, the loss, the, the loss of face. It would be if they had to roll something back, especially if it, you know, if, especially if it's in the same time of a, you know, a successive Tory governments or successive Labour governments. Yeah. But I think by, by the time we got to that point, it'd be that big. It would be difficult to turn it off. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the, the benefits are going to outweigh the cons. It'll be almost be like, well, you, the people can suffer with this thing that hardly works very well. And let's, let's be honest, a lot of the systems of government don't work very well anyway. Yeah. But we're going to keep it in place because it benefits us really well because all of a sudden we've got a little bit more control we can exercise over you in a, in yes. a lot easier way, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I think they'll, like, they'll want affordances of it that they didn't see. You know, th these are emergent technological systems. And for anyone who's worked in blockchains for long enough, they're messy, complicated things that... Um, when one once they're deployed, you start to see, you know, where it worked, where it didn't, and like you, it's very difficult to see coming. Um, and the, you know, if it was something like Bitcoin, right? If the the was Bitcoin will work for the next hundred years, right? Um, but it won't be. It'll essentially be an elaboration. It'd be something much closer to a private um, ledger system, and you know, they'll, they'll install something that probably won't work for, have great longevity. So it won't be our money in the con conventional sense, right? It's just going to be an extension of an application run by the, run by the central bank. But you know what they're going to do is one of the things to pitch it to people as a good idea will be that transparency aspect. They'll say, Hey, blockchain, super transparent. It'll be more, more transparent and they'll say we're going to catch more criminals and people are going to want it. It'll yeah. only be transparent to the people they're allowed to see it. This, I, I, this, I think that they're still going to have a, a cover over the top of it. It's not going to be like, you know, oh, a yeah. public blockchain, is it? It's a not. A public ledger. No, the, there's quite a large difference between private blockchains and, and, and public blockchains. For one, private blockchains, you can actually go and delete someone's money out of it. You know, you, you can't wind back public blockchains once it's theirs and it's self-custodial, right? So I own it and no one can take it from me. Um, that will not be something that they want to keep in CBDCs. Partly because one of the things that I considered a threat to the banks, the one of, one of the things that made FTX go down was the affordances of blockchains. The fact that you could immediately withdraw your money. Um, so everyone just hit withdraw on FTX and it actually did have a blockchain base layer. So the bank run, everyone could just, it was the first come first served. People could just literally call their own money back. Now, that is not something you can do currently with your money in banks everywhere. So we're going to be much more exposed to people who just all of a sudden want their money, and then it's it, it could cause runs on banks, really. With a hypothetically speaking, with a CBDC in a, C, a CBDC in place here in the UK, and the government will want to ensure that any flow of money anywhere doing anything into a personal into an individual, you know, a member of the UK. Bank, in the UK's bank account, but wrong, into their pockets, digital pockets, will need to go via the CBDC. They'll, they will want that, won't they? Can you yep. see a scenario where um, blockchain technologies such as, or other cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, 
are outlawed for use by a citizen of the UK? Um, I think we've got to a dark place if that happens. I mean, you, you won't be able to. I think that's one of the, one of the reasons why yeah. they're, they're very resistant to being banned. Like, so Bitcoin is currently banned in China, but it's heavily used in China. And the reason why it's heavily used in China is because of the capital controls there. So, um, that was the place where Bitcoin had its, you know, first major user adoption because it was in a place where the government tried heavily to, to control people's money. So they went to the thing where it is uncontrollable. Um, so they can make it far more difficult, right? So you, the exchanges, um, you could shut all them down and just say, you know, and to a certain extent, we're starting to see a little bit of this in order to actually go and buy Bitcoin on a UK exchange now. Um, there's much more restrictions. So you, you have to give much more information than you ever have done before. You know, you're talking like, Certainly passports and proof of address and all these sort of things. But this is the regulation we were talking about that was needed what, half an hour ago when we started, right? Yeah, and it depends on... So like, I've been thinking a lot about the regulatory questions in, in, in crypto. The, the systems themselves are permissionless and, and kind of resistant to permissions, which is what regulations are about. So if you do this directly on a blockchain, then you know no one can stop us sending money to each other on the Ethereum network, for example. Um, quite literally impossible. Um, but putting fiat money in, it's where the, the old world meets the new, is where, you know, there actually does need to be safeguards, right? So a lot of the new rules are about stopping people, like, throwing all their money into crypto and getting... It's like investor protection level stuff. So you now have to have a 24-hour cooldown. You can't just go and buy... Bitcoin login, give your information, buy Bitcoin straight away. You have to wait 24 hours. Uh, you have to fill out questionnaires. And like, I understand the risks and, uh, you have to understand if the exchange you're using is FTA, FCA regulated or not, which the average person won't do. So they, they kind of, we're moving back more towards the sort of gated world, uh, where only accredited investors can get exposed. Mean <laughs> Meanwhile. You can go into a casino down the road and chuck, go in there, drunk, and chuck 10k down the, down the pan. Yes. Like, I get it. I yeah. get it. I do get it, but... I mean, that's more a question about gambling than, than, uh, than crypto, but... Yeah, and there was a... There was a committee that popped up um, a year or so ago that was a kind of very Labour... There's one of the things that might happen in Labour, Labour government is they just say let's just regulate crypto like gambling and gambling is regulated and it has to have you know but interestingly it's tax free right if you make a load of money on the dog track you don't pay tax on you don't pay capital gains tax on your winnings so it would be an interesting sort of thing and there is actually clear regulations for it i wouldn't necessarily hate it it sort of delegitimizes the whole space and i think that's what this committee was trying to do this thing's all a scam. Let's just say it's gambling. There's no real utility here. Let's, you know, call it what it is and say, let's regulate it as gambling. Um, but it would be a clear rule set that at least you could build businesses around. The problem is operating, certainly in the UK with crypto, is that the rules are so vague. You don't know what you can and can't do. Like, you don't know if you can launch an NFT in the UK. Sort of can. Uh, it's outside of the perimeter at the moment, but they have to be like selling art, not can't be like you're doing like a crowd sale with it. it can't all be the same. I wanted to ask you about this. Yeah, so, so go, on. go on. Yeah, so there's like it's just all unclear. So um, yeah, I, I, someone is trying to build a business in this in the UK. There's lots of ambiguity about what you can and can't do. So mostly people just go and set it up abroad, right? And they'll go and set up offshore entities to do these things which are far less regulated and far more sort of like um, in the sort of grey area. And that's why you get more scams, because everyone just builds them. You know, it's a huge opportunity for the UK, actually, to be very progressive on these technologies, 
in many ways I, I do see it's like, it's like living in the future. Looking at crypto now is essentially like a window into the future because the technology is early and it's not going away. It's going to mature. So what you're looking at now is basically what's going to be more like what the future is going to be. So there's a huge opportunity for places like the UK, like legitimate jurisdictions to be very progressive and, and build good rule sets so that people can build businesses out of it. So the question I, the question I've got is, so you know from our previous conversation, I don't think, I don't think on air, maybe on air, but definitely off air. You know, I'm, I'm super keen on trying out, out decentralized autonomous organization yeah. stuff in, in, you know, well, as you are as well, in like real world applications. And yes. one, of the, one of those areas I think it could be really useful. One for transparent reasons and all the other reasons that, you know, I think that was a good, you think that was a good idea for different things is in the charity space. Yes. You know, it's in running and managing charities, right? Yeah. But when the new, when, uh, it was last year, must have been last year, of, of, not long after our conversation, you know, rules changed in the UK, regulations changed in the UK around crypto. And I thought, Shit, I I can't. I, I would never be able to start up a DAO because it would mean the it would inevitably mean the issuing of tokens, creation of a token, issuing of tokens to people. Yeah, which can imply probably almost always does imply some kind of financial risk, maybe to, of a minimal level. But am I right in saying that, or is there a way in the UK now to set up a DAO without having to jump through FCA hoops? So, at the moment, there's. Essentially, there's like a financial, most of where this is covered is in the financial promotion rules, right? So now some of this I'm down for. So for a while, just down here in Liverpool Street Tube, there was a, you know, loads of adverts, um, for something called like Seifu token with like four Fs on it. And it said, knock, knock, who's there? Crypto. And it was a QR code. You scan the QR code. You could literally just like throw your money into it, say, I want to put this much money into it. And it was a total Ponzi. It was, it was a total scam. It took me five seconds to realize this was a scam. How did you realize? Just, it was just so obviously, it was such a hilarious scam that like the guy who was running it, you know, he was like sponsoring, there was like videos of him down at like an F1 track and he'd like sponsored a car and total classic confidence scam. Like I looked at the smart contracts. It was a classic, like I, I knew the contract he was using. It was a Ponzi. And this was advertised to everyone getting off the tube in London, right? So there clearly needs to be something that stops that, right? Because if that's the entry point for people in crypto and they immediately go and get scammed and it was the whole system was designed to make it very easy to put as much money as you've got into this thing. Um, so as a kind of reaction to this and, and in many ways, I kind of understand the FCA's position on this. Like every few years, they get loads of calls saying, I've been scammed, do something about it. And they're just fed up of it, right? The, the fed up of people just ring, be, you know, coming in and getting scammed. And, you know, it's like Dorothy from Kent has just lost five grand off someone who's, and largely it's people ringing people up, you know, and getting them. It's not, again, it's not even crypto. It's crypto is this fancy new thing. It'll make loads of money put your money in, and all you're doing is sending your money directly to some scammers. You know, you, you've never actually ha had any cryptos. Mm -hmm. Most of the people, I get calls all the time saying, Nick, have I been scammed or have I made loads of money? <laughs> and it turns out they've just sent their money to somebody on the other end of a phone line. It's never touched crypto, right? Yeah. They've just used crypto as the shiny new technology that might make you loads of money, confidence gain. So... Where we're at now in the regulations, these financial promotion laws have come in, which are really onerous and, and like, so they have this thing where you've got to like pass a questionnaire, 24 hour cool down, which is largely to stop people getting home drunk and, you know, YOLOing their, their money into some shit coin or something. Um, and you know, you now, but you now have to get your like tweets approved by the FCA. Right. So you have to have these very specific disclaimers. The disclaimers have to be visible. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it's impossible to comply to. Now, if you, um, you literally have to go and send your like tweets to, uh, an authority who like goes, yeah, okay, that's got the disclaimers on properly. And then, then you can talk about whatever you're doing. 
So that all has compliance costs, right? And that's if it's a token. You could set up a DAO now. That's wild. That's wild. That, that, yeah. that, though, that is a money spinner. That level oh, yeah. of regulation is just a money spinner. It. I, th I looked into doing it because I thought this is a gravy train, yeah. right? And I actually can DD crypto projects, right? So I'm, I'm like, I would be in a good position to actually say, no, that's a scam. Like, don't yeah. advertise this on the tube, right? Um, but again, it's a very, the application process is like crazy. You know, only if existing players in the game yeah. can really get in there. It's not exactly an open system. Um, yeah, but and, what I mean is having to, having to tell people they have, you have to send your marketing communication, every single one you want to do to, to us for us to check it. Is yeah. there another industry that does that to that level? Not that I know of. Now, so it seems all, it seems a bit unnecessary to me. Well, this is where it's going to. So there's like, since we've last talked, there's been a few regulatory moves, like particularly the EU have brought in this thing called MICA, which, you know, as typically EU fashions, 200 page PDF with, you know, like only bureaucratic mumbo jumbo that like no one can really understand this. I'm currently trying to write a MICA compliant white paper and it's a, it's a nightmare, but a lot of this. The way that they're trying to sort of intermediate, re-intermediate the market is that in order to do this properly, you have to come send us all your code. They've just done this with AI as well. And a lot of what I'm working on at the moment is the kind of crossover of crypto and AI. We might talk about AI for a little bit as well, but, um, they want to basically you send everything to, um, they in the EU, they were, were called conformity assessment bodies and the first draft of this bill, I just couldn't believe it. If you searched for the word conformity in it, it was in four, 470 times or something like that. So the whole document was just about conformity, which is totally antithetical to crypto, right? Anyone can publish a smart contract to a blockchain. Anyone can set these things up. And in fact, this happens every day. So it's not stopping any scams because scammers don't ask for permission, right? <laughs> so what you get is the barrier to entry for all of these things is going up and up and up. And that's what's troubling me about DAOs at the moment. Even people in very into the DAO space are all about like, yeah, you've got to go and use these new emerging DAO frameworks and pay all these lawyers. And it's starting to cost, you know, 50, 100, 250K to set up a DAO to do all the, and that was not the point. The point was that we, it was closer to a, throwing a kitty together in the pub, right? You know, it's like, we all, let's all chuck 20 quid in the pot and we'll drink until it's gone. That's closer to what a DAO is meant to be in my mind than setting up an offshore Cayman foundation and all this kind of network of stuff and paying boards of, you know, paying directors to sit here and it has these huge, massive costs. The point was that it was meant to be easier for us to coordinate. It was easier for us to gather our money together reach decisions, get stuff done. Um, easier than setting up a company, you know, easier than setting up trusts and any of these other structures, just a way for us to coordinate quickly. And all of these sort of compliance hoops just make it costly and it, and it limits the affordances of the technology. So like makes it just harder and harder to do. So consequently, only the people who are already power players in the market get to do it. So largely that's what we've seen in crypto over the last few years. DAOs have actually, since we've talked, got pretty big actually. Um, there's a couple of DAOs with like seven billion dollar treasuries. Holy shit. Yeah, that um you know, they're governing um some of these blockchains, like particularly what are called layer two blockchains. So Ethereum is very secure but slow. So people have spun out these like what are called layer twos, where it's another blockchain that uses Ethereum for security. And then a lot of these have these treasuries. Um, and I'm involved in some of them and, and it's very open governance. You know, and there's lots of people sort of bidding for access to these treasuries and it gets, uh, given out by vote. Um, and some of them have given out hundreds of millions of dollars in grants to, um, to developers of, of, of projects. So there's, we're close to something really transformative here. Like there's going to be DAOs in the future that have billions of dollars in them that fund all sorts of stuff, public goods, you know, like public infrastructure, art, whatever you can imagine. 
So the potential is there, but the problem is the only people who are getting to do it at the moment have raised like hundreds of millions of dollars from VCs and things like that. So if I wanted to, if I was going to set up a charity, if I wanted to set up a charity, or a charity by name, it was a charitable organization, and I wanted to do it with a, from the start, with a DAO yeah. structure, pretty much impossible for me to do that. Well, I think there's... Unless I've got shed loads of cash in my skyrocket. If you wanted to do it in terms of state-of-the-art compliance, yes. But there's, like, for, I think this is an interesting thought experiment. Like, let's say we wanted to set up a charity now. Let's say we wanted to um, um, set up the H-Hour charity. Like, you could, as it currently stands, um, get people to donate into a multi-sig, like a multi-signature wallet. So I could be a signer, you could be a signer, and we could find another friend, right? And it meant that two of three of us needed to say yes if any funds were to come out. Um, now, you could just put a donation box and say anyone who wants to donate, like we could set up an ENS for it. So we could set up hour.f. And you could put it on Twitter and say anyone who wants this charity to happen, just throw money into it. Um, and there's no laws prohibiting that at the moment. So it's just like, in fact, it's out of perimeter. It would be, um, now technically, you know, it gets complicated with things like anti money laundering laws because, you know, people do, you know, put dodgy money in that things. side of it. It's not that side of it. I'm, I'm really concerned, not concerned about that. And it's not that bit that appeals to me. It is so. It is that if I was going to, let's say, I mean, that you talk about there is, you know, Billy, Billy basic stuff, right? And, yeah. And, the, and it's like, well, why can't you just do that now with uh, like an old bank or whatever? Yeah. But so, so the, the side of it is the DAO front is, is the automation side. Yeah. The uh, automated, like decision making and validation of work. Yeah. And the consensus agreement on what should and shouldn't be done. Yes. That side. So everyone, has the say and no everyone has a the the opportunity to interact with the DAO with the charity yeah. in the way that they've been promised that yes. cannot be removed from them yeah and uh, and everything is completely transparent yeah from the from how fund how funds are raised to yeah. how the charity is spending those funds where they are going and how they are validating where those fund those funds are going and then operating efficiently in an efficient manner, as we know, DAOs have the really good ability to do so. So it's yep. that members of the DAO side, yeah, the people who are the in the organisation, the the yeah, the, the members of the members of the charity. In essence, yes, that side is where I think. So um, yeah, I think that you know, if we play that out, we could say, well, actually, instead of just putting your donating into a box, actually, what you get is voting rights on how we collectively spend this money. So you get a say over how the treasury is spent. So you're, you, 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 you're making a donation, but it's actually you're buying rights to decision on how the pot gets spent. Yeah, you have a kind of... Becoming pro, a member. In, in some, some setups, yeah, you have a kind of, um, kind of very purist DAO idea. Is if I put 5% of the money in, I get 5% over the say over how the treasury is spent. So we could say, okay, let's go and fund this, um, you know, Let's say we just gonna want to go on a, put a fundraising event on, right? So I need five thousand pounds to, um, you know, book a venue, do this, that, and the other, get some event, like get some entertainment on, and we're gonna run a fundraising event for for the for the DAO. You put a proposal in, um, you as you, I'm gonna set up the uh, this fundraising event. This is the proposal for how I'm gonna do it, and if a threshold of people agree. We say, okay, let's fa send five thousand pounds to you, and then you know you go then go back to the DAO with all the evidence that you've done this thing, um, and then they're more likely to trust you to do something else in the future. But ultimately, everyone who's donated to this thing gets a material say over it, which is very different to how charities work at the moment. Right? And, the, and, and the key is, you know, guaranteed that say, yes. right? Like, yeah, guaranteed that say. So yeah, so. That money, now the five grand doesn't come to me, it goes into the treasury of the DAO. Yep. And that, and that, you know, if the DAO is set up in, in the right way, that means that I 
that money can't go anywhere. Let's say the rule is, like you just said, let's say the rule is that in order to take money from the treasury to donate to a beneficiary, someone someone or some organization we feel like they need charitable support, yeah. then let's say the rule is, well, 50% of the members of the DAO, the, the members of the charity have to agree to it. Yeah. And the money literally does cannot get released, technically cannot get released until 50% of the members yeah. check a digital checkbox, the treasury goes, yep, yeah, and unlocks its doors to however much was agreed to leave the treasury's doors That's digitally. Right. Te- yeah. Literally, if it cannot be done, the contract, the coding says it cannot be done. Yeah, without the consent without it, of right. the members. Which is why I'm pointing out to, to people, I know you know this, you're saying what happens is guaranteed. Yeah, it's encoded into smart contracts, so it's actually unchangeable. Like, the rules of the game can't be changed again unless by the same rules. So what you can do with DAOs is say, okay, we want to do a little bit more stuff. So you could say, these are beneficiaries, let's say we've, we've created a list of beneficiaries, we will only send money to these people that we're happy with. And one of the other things that you can do with DAOs is like, we can say, well, we can pay all of them in one go. And we can pay all of them based on um, a consensus vote. So one of the things we're working on is like, we want to spend £100,000 on donations. Um, we can find a consensus amongst ourselves over what weighted payments go to these things. So we can all have a vote. And instead of just voting yes or no, you can say, I want to vote. I want like five going, like five votes on this one, three votes on that one, four votes on this one. And you get a kind of, um, like what's kind of called quadratic funding. So you get this kind of, um, payoff profile and you could fund a hundred things at once with a single transaction. And, um, that's really exciting. So you can, you can do like exceptional efficiency, things like charities. A lot of it is just the administration of all these things. So yeah, with the DAO, you could just pass governance votes to say, let's add these 10 new beneficiaries to it. You know, so you can change the rules, you can change the quorum. So you can say, actually, it's really difficult getting 51% of everyone. Most people are just happy with you making a lot of the decisions. So we, we, we're struggling to get 51%, so you can change it to 30%, and things like that. And there's a, that's part of the governance of these things. But yeah, the radical transparency and the efficiency um, is the great promise of these things. The problem is, is that a couple of these DAOs have been um, sued, like one, since, since we've last spoke, a DAO went to court in America and right. got sued as a DAO. So the, the CFTC, Commodities Futures and Trading Commission in America actually sued a DAO. But what did they, was it, what did they categorize the organization as? A DAO. So, a DAO? Yeah, they did say this is a DAO. We're suing the DAO. And of course, the DAO didn't turn up in court because it was a smart contract, right? <laughs> And so the law passed and it created some precedent that, and what was scary about that was that they actually sued the DAO via the governance forum and they served all of the members, which meant anyone holding a token in one of these DAOs was technically on the hook for, to the CFTC. So one of the dangers of these Jesus. things. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they sued like something like eight. I think it was 8,000 token holders of this thing. And technically, they were all liable for what this DAO had done. That's doing. crazy. Is that not the equivalent of... <sighs> kind of, it's really hard to draw a comparison here, but a, a corporation yep. being set up on some principles and and processes and ways of doing things that actually are fundamentally may have a problem or do not kind of meet the legal requirements in the country it's operating in. People don't realise... They're working in that corporation. The corporation is doing whatever it's supposed to do, as it was set up to do. Yep. And then the 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 country where that company is operating says, "You motherfuckers, yep. that company's done. You're doing bad things." And then everyone in the company gets um, gets found guilty or yeah, liable, with the same, liable That's, for so, the same charges. Yeah. So what? The, Bonkers. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I, like this was the. Funnily enough, I was giving a talk that day. Um, a, 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 a UK conference called Zebu Live and about DAOs and I said, you know, what's happening with regulations? So I said, well, if ever they deem token holders themselves to be liable, 
and for anything a DAO does. Now, this DAO that got sued was essentially operating um, like a leverage trading system, which is in the remit. It's a regulated activity in America. Um, I don't think they were American-based, actually, but um, this 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 DAO was doing something that the CFTC thinks that they should have the permissions. You know, you, you can only do this if we say, right? Because it was de decentralized, it's a DeFi DAO, it was just doing it anyway without permission. Um, yeah, I said, like, if they ever say the token holders are liable for, for this kind of stuff, then this is as strong a message as you, as you can get that they're trying to stop this from happening. Mm. And it happened that day. I think stop DAOs from happening. Yeah. yeah. Like, they're trying to suppress this thing from happening. I, the, I was reading a, a sort of book that just came out this week, actually, from a group of lawyers that have all, like, um, done a chapter each on their various takes on it. And the opening chapter said that it's very likely that DAOs are going to be the most important thing in corporate governance and, and, and corporate law this century. So they think it's big. The lawyers think it's big. A lot of the like actually in crypto, people don't particularly like them because they're a bit messy and and uh, people are largely bearish on them. But but that's the other that's the other uh, that's the other aspect I wanted to bring up with you. But, you know you know what I do for a living, and I'm sure you see yep. it in areas of what you do for a living. I see. I I would love nothing more than to be able to test a small DAO yep. in the corporation I work for to to to, pr to prove that hey, this is a really efficient way of doing things. Yes, but. Like maybe that maybe what those lawyers are seeing is that once corporations and like the commercial sector see and people with the money in their pockets they set something set up, see how lean an organization can run yep. and turn over the same and turn and turn over bigger profits as a result, achieving the same thing that they're achieving now with one thousand, two thousand, fifty employees, whatever. Yeah. Maybe that's what they're seeing. Because it, it makes total sense, but I think that the, the they're potentially worried about the efficiency. I think they're more worried about the oversight. It's like it's a, it's a structure that is decentralized. It's not necessarily jurisdictional, right? So they want to be able to, whose feet can we hold over the coals for what this DAO is doing? And if they can't point to, like, you can't send, like, a letter to it, right? You can't send it a fax. Right, you can't turn up and on its door. And it's always the founders, window. though, is it not, Nick? It's always Sorry? found. It's always founders. Right? And this is the thing, right? So this is where the the kind of attack here is. We, there's existing legal form called a general partnership, and what they can say is this DAO is a general partnership, which means every member is liable for what the partnership has been doing. Um, and yes, that means, oh, I just innocently bought, you know, five bucks of a token and I'm now on the hook for the CFTC is a reality, right? Why couldn't you do something like, we're going to look at the charities, you know, when, when a, <clears throat> with, a, with a, in a charity in the UK, you have to have a minimum of, I think it's a minimum of three trustees. Yeah. I think it's a minimum of three trustees. Now, why couldn't you do something like that, like legislate, that if you're going to yes. set up a DAO, that you must have a minimum of X number of people who are legally responsible for it, and then build in that you cannot you cannot leave the DAO. You will be considered a DAO unless the DAO record, the chain state shows that the, the trusteeship, yes. the legal responsibility has been handed to a another person. Yeah, and that's kind of where we're at now. So there's these emerging legal forms. There's these things called dunas in America. Dunas what stands for it's like. Um, you know, legalese stuff, but there's like these different, um, like Wyoming have created a DAO framework. The Law Commission in the UK have started talking about it at least. They released a paper on it. So it, it's like we've not got the legislation yet. That kind of thing you're talking about is what's needed. Yeah. Right. And. Do they, no DAO. A new legal framework. Sorry. A new legal framework for decentralized autonomous organizations. Yeah. Do no decentralized, unincorporated, not-for-profit organization a is a legal entity framework created by the states of Wyoming, USA, specifically designed for DAOs. It aims to provide a legal structure for DAOs to operate. Key, f can I give, quickly go through this? Yeah. All right. Okay. Key features: legal ex legal existence. Donors are recognised as separate legal entities, distinct from their members, distinct from their members for for purposes of determining and enforcing rights, duties, and liabilities in contract and tort. 
liability protection. Individual members of a doona are not held personally liable for the actions of the association. At for profit activities, doonas can engage in for profit activities and reasonably compensate members for their contributions. So it just sounds like a normal company so far, doesn't it? Yeah. Governing principles. Membership in a doona is based on your association's governing principles. In the absence of such principles, a person is considered a member upon purchasing or assuming ownership of a membership interest or other property that confers a voting right. Benefits, preserves decentralization, legal certainty, protection of members, and innovation. Okay. The, the trick is here that it makes you pick a jurisdiction. So a lot of these things, it's uh, like, you know, you're not uh, everywhere and nowhere structure anymore. Right, you're mm. not like Ethereum, you're not like Bitcoin, you're not like actually a decentralized thing. You're now based in Wyoming, right? And you are basically saying these people are responsible. Mm. And and there's legal overhead to this and you know there's there's um administrators and there's like intermediaries that need to be named and it's kind of it's in tension with the kind of original idea of a DAO, essentially, which is just like a group of random internet, anonymous random internet friends can throw money into a pot and do something online together. So we're like rubbing up against the the the, the, the argument, real world. Tension. The argument is that that shouldn't be a problem if you're going out there with uh, with um, positive intent or honest intent. Yes. No. Well. <laughs> yeah. And someone put your name on the paper. <laughs> well, again, apart from the cost, right? There's 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 mm. a real cost of coordinate, like. What I'm in this for is to find new ways of coordinating with people. And we'll talk a little bit in a minute of how you might be able to do this in, in this organization. And like, I'm working on a project called London Voice, which is, um, as soon as you take away the, um, financial component to it, it gets a lot easier, right? So you can get a lot of the affordances out of the coordination. Um, Without taking it to this place where there's, it's, it's all about risk. So, yes, if you've got good intentions, but in decentralized systems, people can do stuff that you can't control. Right. So, um, you know, the, there might be actors in this DAO that get a grant out of it and go and do something bad with it. Um, in a and, corporation example. Yeah. Taking away the financial incentive. Would, would I would not like that, yeah, because it takes away the incentive to pay attention to what you're voting on, right? You're yes. paying less attention to it, you're less emotionally connected with it, you let you care less about the results. And there's different grades of this, right? So let, you let's... could connect it to a bonus. Yes, yeah, so you can do you can do money, you can do incentives, yeah. you can do financial bit. It's when there's a traded secondary market asset that it gets a lot more complicated. Uh, explain that to me. So let if we launch a token, yeah. So if we launch so so. Big way, like publicly launched token. Yeah. So, like, if we forget all the rules and regulations and compl complexities around, you know, people saying if this is okay or not, the real dream for this was the we set up a decentralized system. Group of people all say we want to set up, um, like, um, let's say London DAO, right? We want to set up London DAO. Group of Londoners get together. Um, and we, we don't have any money, right? Yet. We're just a group of people who are coordinating around this idea. We can decide what rules we're going to put by. No money's in the pot yet. But one of the things you could do is launch a cryptocurrency. You can launch, launch London coin, right? Now, if I can sell a bunch of that, so we've built all the tools to do this, actually, right? So you can mint London coin and it's all in the DAO, 100% of it. Well, let's say we send, sell 20% of it to the global market. Um, and we could give it any utility we wanted to, right? If you, um, hold a thousand London coins, when you're in London, you can come to the London DAO parties or whatever. Could be anything, right? <laughs> or we can have, use it as a local currency. Um, if you spend London coin in the bar, you get 15% off your beer. Uh, that kind of stuff. So if I sell 20% of this and I or and we auction it, right? So we don't know what the value is. Could be, you know, a millionth of a pence, could be a dollar each. We just don't know. Don't know what the market wants for it yet. So you can auction it. 
in, in these sort of ways where you just discover the price of it, what the market is willing to pay for it. And then that goes in, that, that creates liquidity, um, for a decentralized exchange. So now you can buy and sell it with Ethereum or dollars or whatever forevermore, basically. It's now got a market. So we've bootstrapped a market when normally you would have had to go into like the London Stock Exchange or something like that to have a tradable 24-7 liquid market, or not even a 24-7 one. Um, to get a liquid market on an asset, you'd need to go to one of these centralized venues. Now we can do it without. But now London Dow has 80% of this token in its treasury. And it could be worth $100 million. Right? You, you know, the, the current market cap is $20 million. Um, so the remainder in the, in the, in the DAO is equally like, could be worth a thousand. Yeah. Could be worth <laughs> yeah, anything, yeah, right? Yeah. But nevertheless, we've bootstrapped some money that in theory we, we could spend. So we've bootstrapped an economic system out of nowhere. And we've done that with a cryptocurrency. That's the regulatory tricky bit. I do want to do this, by the way. <laughs> I like actually looking into what, London DAO. Yeah. Like, um, because you can actually bootstrap like massive value out of nowhere. So these DAOs that have got seven billion dollars in, what they effectively did was sell ten percent of the cryptocurrency and keep ninety percent in the treasury. And now they've got a seven billion dollar treasury because the value of this in the market is X and Y, right? And the goal is managing can you sell this into the market, realize, you know, without crashing the price and and, and it's that's that's the governance game. So it's a way of bootstrapping economic systems out of nowhere and giving people like let's say we did bootstrap London Dow out of nowhere there's a hundred million dollars in a treasury and the all you need to be is a Londoner in order to get a say over how it's spent and we all deliberate how we spend it and how we can build value in that economy and you know we'll send some people out to try and do deals with shops and bars and all this sort of stuff to try and build an economy out of it um, that was always the dream for me, right? And it, it's difficult because you've got to actually broker the interest. Let's say we've got everyone in London gets a shout on this. Um, how do you broker the interests of so many diverse views and, and all that sort of stuff? So you need voting technologies and collaborative proposal systems. And again, this is a lot of what, um, we've built. Um, we could do this to, like next week if we wanted to. It's just that we don't know if we'd go to jail for it. Right. We just don't know how, how, um, how much we'd be breaking the law. Now, at the very least, we need to go to the FCA and say, you know, can we promote London coin to the people of London? This is what we're going to do with it. Um, and yeah, there's just ambiguity and compliance steps around it. One second, I'm going to ask the gentleman next door to stop moving. Fuck. No, so anything. I can barely hear it. Can barely yeah. hear it. I'm deaf as opposed to you, so you can't hear it. Carry on. <laughs> I'm probably nice more to, deaf than nice you, Nice to watch him. <laughs> We're looking at cameras here in the, in the studio, yeah, someone next door hovering. Excellent. Um, Sorry, so, yeah, like, so what we've started with is... The next Why didn't you just ask? Why didn't you ask the FCA? It just costs so much money. And just to ask? Just to get advice? Yeah, well... You to do it properly, you need to pay lawyers and all this. We, we're going to, right? So the for one, you need the sort of like exact entry point and like the plan. Um, we're starting with a, a a far less risky plan. Well, we're starting with a plan that is purely about the reaching consensus bit. So we're going to set up a DAO called London Voice. We're not even going to call it a DAO. Right, it's just you like I can give you a pass to come in. We're gonna run uh like citizens assemblies, gather people of London into a room, and if you come to one of our meetings, we onboard you into the DAO and you get a voting pass and you talk to an AI agent about the issues that you care about. Right? And we all talk together, have a you know, round table about things that we care about in London. Um we can record the voices in the room and it all gets captured with AI and it generates a vote. What issues do you care about? And it's a list of tags and people vote on it. And 
we create an AI agent, London Voice, that's like a digital representative of the people. And that's what I think is the unlock for DAOs, because this agent will help us make decisions across many thousands of people. But on the legal side, is the issue that, um, since now you're talking about London DAO, is the issue that you, in order to generate interest in the DAO, you would have to indicate a, a pot potential financial return for people who want to join it? Because it'll cost a join, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, that's the issue is that, you know, there's people, people sell cryptocurrency says you're going to guarantee to make a thousand percent on this quickly. And that happens a lot, happens all the time. And they're always scams, right? So what they're trying to do is to stop people, um, miss selling a volatile asset as a guaranteed win, mm. which again makes total sense. So what, the, what they've done is just like rather clumsily, moved crypto into the existing financial regulations like I'm selling a mortgage product or something like that. But in reality, you know, there's like at one point recently there was 30,000 new coins in a day. <laughs> right? So these aren't mortgage products. You know, they're, they're meme coins m mostly, right? They're just like, it's a coin, do you want it? You know, and people actually collect these things and they perceive value in these things that is completely different to when any... When you say coin, you mean token, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. It's like a meme coin is basically. Oh, a meme coin. Yeah, sorry, a meme coin. Yeah, yeah. yeah they are token, tokens. Token, They're yeah. basically, it's, um, it used to be quite tricky to make these things, but people have created apps where you can literally just print them out. Like the, anyone can make one. Like, um, I, there's an app. The, the most profitable. For fuck's app. sake, don't say the app on you. <laughs> go on. You can Do you know which one I'm talking no, about? No, go on, go on. Um, there's an app called pump.fun. Let me write that down. Pump dot fun. Pump yeah. dot fun. Yeah. Um, don't buy any tokens on this thing. Do not. Right? Okay. But you can look at it. It's, it's like pump dot fun and it's like a mixture of like 4chan and crypto. And it's just like, it's like, you know, the scummiest message, message board on the internet. And it's just people making like, you know, they'll just say it's like burger coin. Or something like that. Yeah. Or a picture of, but and you can see people buying these things, and they encourage you to just make your own cryptocurrency on this thing. P pump dot fun. Yeah. Pump, pu how it works is I'm looking at the website. It's got a pop up. Yeah. And the, the UI is not that great. It's just flicking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Pump prevents rugs by making sure that all created tokens are safe. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> I knew you were going to laugh at that. They're not safe. Each coin on Pump is a fair launch with no pre-sale and no team allocation. Step one, pick a coin that you like. Step two, buy the coin on the bonding curve. Step three, sell it any time to lock in your profits or losses. Step four, when enough people buy on the bonding curve, it reaches a market cap of $69,000. Step five, $12,000 of liqu liquidity is then deposited in radium and burned. And click, I'm ready to pump. I'm ready to pop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God's sake. Yeah. Okay. This is. Uh, why is it not safe, Nick? Why is it not safe? Yeah. It just told me it's safe. It must be safe. Yeah, yeah. They're very much not safe, right? They're, it's a, it's gambling. It's basically so. How this thing works is, um, you, I don't know. You come to this. I, I'm going to make like you coin, right? And you put a picture of your face up. You got and, one buyer. You got and, one buyer. And, you know, um, essentially people buy it on a, what's called a bonding curve. It mentioned a bonding curve then. So it, let's say it starts at like a millionth of a dollar, something like that, right? It's a millionth of a dollar. But then it goes up this curve. The more people buy it, it goes up this curve. And if it hits the top of it, it sends the value some, curve, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah this yeah. value curve. There's enough money in the smart contract to now make a, a market on a decentralized exchange. Which means I can now sell, um, Q coins for Solana. That's on, on the Solana blockchain. And there's now a liquid market for these things and you can trade it up and down and all this sort of stuff. Um, and most of these things last like hours. Like most of them never make it out of this curve. Um, and there's a whole game at play where if you know what you're doing, you can like convince people to, so if I buy it here when it's like a millionth of a penny and then convince a bunch of people to buy it up here, I can then just sell it onto them. And 
I've made loads of money and I've just take so it is a rug. You know, like a rug pull. You can just take money off people. And that's largely how most of these things work, right? Some of them make it for a few days. But that app has made a hundred million dollars this year. <laughs> people who launch that app have made one hundred million dollars off it. It's also fun to do, right? I mean it, hey, it is kind of fun. Hey, it's, maybe on coin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well <laughs> exactly. And it, like you can literally I I told some guy So you can make him that is that's making a meme coin on there. That's what that is. Yeah, yeah. Create your own meme coin. Okay, I, right. I told some guy in the pub about this like earlier in the year and by like you know, by the time I'd come back from the toilet he'd launched one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just like, Oh yeah, I've done it. And um so in one sense it's got like super trivial to launch these things, right? But if actually you want to do one technically legally, you know, you've got to go and spend half a million dollars on lawyers, right? So we're stuck in this weird world where actually most of the assets making the market is these totally scammy, trivial things. And anyone who's actually trying to build something real and, and do it properly, it costs millions of dollars now. Right. It, it's Right. <clears throat> we're going to carry on the charity DAO conversation yep. and the corporation mini DAO co conversation yep. um, at, a, at another time because I do want to get on to... So the, I, I've mentioned this before. I talked to other people about this, and I, I can't remember where I read it. You know, it may have been Balaji. Oh, I, yeah. I read it or heard it from, and he was talking about. I'm assuming it's him. If not Balaji, well done. I'm getting the credit to you anyway. It was about people aren't most people aren't realizing like how much change is coming to the world. There's been so much in the last 20, 30 yeah. years. There is an incredible amount coming in the next 10, 15 years. And the reference by assuming it was Balaji said this, the reference was there are four, there are four technologies all about to mature at the same time. Yeah. All maturing at the same time, as in at the same time, relatively speaking, at the same time in the universe and the history of time within the next 10, 15 years. Blockchain technology. Yep. Artificial intelligence, space travel. And I always forget the fourth one. It's, it's like biotechnology, basically. Is it biotech? Are you yeah. Sure? There's a whole bunch. So there's actually space many travel. of these that, that's, um, artificial intelligence. It's the idea of technological convergence. Basically, right. all these are maturing. So normally, if this was a different universe, if just one of these was maturing on its own, like like the internet matured, the, inf yeah. the like information technology matured in the nineties, yeah, early noughties, and that changed the world. Yeah, any one of these four would change the world on its own. They're all maturing at about the same time. And yes. earlier on, you mentioned AI and crypto. Do you want to get into that? Should we get into that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's kind of very much where, yeah, I spent the last two years very deep in AI. I used to work in, like, do AI stuff like 10 years ago. And, um. What do you mean you did I AI stuff? So I, I built an app, um. Pump.fun. No, it wasn't pump.fun. <laughs> it was in a university. It was called, uh, Memory Bank. And its goal was to kind of aggregate, it was to build organizational memory for institutions. And it was, I'm very much still working on this idea. I, a lot of what I've been working on, I've been chasing for 10 years. I'm getting very close to it now. There's been a few missing pieces. Um, the idea of that was that, you know, we all meet in these groups. It was like, a, it was a decentralized organization. It was a few years before DAOs. And the idea is we take the big problems that we're working on at the institutional level and break them down into these sub-communities. So instead of working on the big problem, we'll, let's say we want to get better at um, e-assessment, for example. We set up an e-assessment group and people go in these and there's actually like a hundred of these different communities. But what you need is to get the information out of those silos back into the the, the sort of organizational memory. And I built a tool that used early sort of AI systems to be able to intelligently discover the documents that you're looking for. Um, but since then, we've had this kind of huge breakthrough um, with a paper. It all came from this paper called Attention is All You Need, which um, created this breakthrough moment in AI. And it used these things called attention mechanisms. Um, and it was a way of like rapidly scaling the amount of um, output you get from these things using kind of fancy like calculus, like dot product um, vector calculus. You can um, 
compress huge amounts of information into basically just like a series of numbers, like matrix multiplication. And this was a massive breakthrough because it allowed you to navigate huge amounts of data very quickly um, and get these natural language mechanisms, like large language models out of it. So, yeah, we've got this breakthrough moment in AI. We, we Crypto, essentially, the big bang moment was the Bitcoin Genesis block in, like, 2008, 2009. Um, AI's been coming longer than we've been alive, right? You can trade, like, AI's been coming for a lot longer. That's the big one. Um, it's very much since the people have been talking about automated systems and artificial intelligence for a hundred years. You know, since the dawn of like Boolean algebra, it's been one of the first things that we've been talking about as intelligent machines one day. This has been coming an awful long time. We've just had this breakout moment and it's gone absolutely exponential. Um, and you've got all these big players burning loads of money training these massive AI models and it's synergistic. So AI is unlocking all of these other disciplines as well because you get this much better capability of handling large data. So that's where you get these convergence things because it's unlocking biotechnology because bioinformatics is leveraging AI. You know, it's we're discovering new things in mathematics. We're discovering new things in physics. We're doing breakthroughs in medicine. It's all because of AI, right? This is the thing with it, isn't it? You've got, you've got the... I was just thinking there when you was, when you were talking about the exponential. I was thinking, yeah, I, I, it seems to me there's an improvement in the way in AI that I see. Am I just layman bloke using AI in terms of either search or yep. like text, yep. text uh, prompts on ChatGPT or Venice or whatever it is? And it seems to me on a weekly basis these things are improving. Most yep. most notably in search functions like in Brave or in Google. Yep. And I was thinking that you've got two things going on. You've got You've got the, the actual technology, the exponential like improvement in that technology is rapid, but you've also got the exponential almost realization and understanding of how organizations yeah. can use it to yes. meet demands and, and create new markets for Joe Public. Yes, and th yeah. this is the bit I'm interested in, because actually at the moment we're largely just using these things as a kind of, like I say, like a search replacement it's like a digital librarian at the moment, right? Or a friend you can talk to. It's just a bot, right? And we're just talking to it. And we haven't really found the really concrete examples of how it disrupts organizations. And But that's coming, right? How it's actually used in practice is the hard bit, right? How do you... We've, we've, we've kind of unlocked this magic tool, but no one's really used it yet for anything like super practically important. But it's starting to happen. Like just today, Salesforce... Um, announced that they saved 50,000 man hours in 90 days, which is 25 years work, um, by installing a few dozen AI agents into their workflows. So they've, they've just saved 50,000 man hours that they didn't have to pay for, right? So that's, that's about a hundred people over for three months they don't need anymore, right? And they're starting to find these unlocks again today, Klarna, which is one of the big sort of fintech companies, they've they not just don't have call centers anymore. They had you know ten thousand bots and call centers, shut them all down. No, they're just one hundred percent AI agents. Um, but they've even stopped using other software providers because the AI is doing it now. So they've stopped using Salesforce. Interestingly, so they, I think that's a those two announcements, them coming out and saying we're in, yeah. into AI and Klarna saying we're not using Salesforce anymore. We're starting to get these massive efficiency unlocks because of AI. And it's, and it creates this accelerative, like, thing, right? Because like we're, we're winning money back on efficiency that you can reinvest into innovation. Um, and it's, it's going in, in, in an incredible rate. Um, so yeah, like, and crypto is coming into this. Crypto is an automation technology in itself, right? So, um, essentially Bitcoin is like a big automaton. It's like an automated machine. There's humans at the edges 
um, that you know do all the mining and all that sort of stuff. But ultimately, it's an automated technology. It looks after itself. In in a sense, it is a kind of AI. Um, so these two things are going to merge. Um, and there's really exciting things in there and really quite dangerous things in there. Um, and yeah, people are going, are really not quite prepared for, for how much the world is going to change very quickly. Um, and yeah, it's very evident that we don't get it yet because like, for example, the, the, the Labour Party have just cancelled our big a AI project. We were going to spend $2 billion nearly on building a AI supercomputer we... in the UK. Oh, the UK were going to do it. Right? Yeah, we yeah, were yeah. going to build a, a big AI supercluster in, I think it was Edinburgh. Um, and we just pulled it. Why? Saving money, right? It's like, it's, it's incredibly short sighted. We, like, this is this moment in time. It's like the start of the race, right? It's like the gun's gone off and you've got people like Sam Altman running, you know, he's out in front. And Not anymore. People, he, well, he's got Bill Gates kind of on his shoulder, right? Okay, you know, Bill, Bill Bill's giving him the push. Um, so you've got Bill Gates, you've got Google, you've got Apple, you know, you've got Amazon, you've got the, all of these. Bill people. Gates and SPF are tight. Even now. Sam Altman, I'm talking about, not Sam, different, different oh, Sam. Oh, Sam Altman, sorry, sorry. Sam sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> interestingly, <laughs> they both launched Sam coins. Sorry. Like, Sam, SPF got famous for launching Sam, they, they, they were called Sam coins in the space because they were just well known scams, right? He, they, he would like, do this really egregious thing where you would sell 1%, you know, what I was saying earlier, you can sell 20% of the cryptocurrency and what the value you've got left over is what you've got in the treasury. What Sam Bankman Fried would do is launch 1% of the token. So if you can keep this at $10 million, you'd have a billion dollars yeah. here. And actually, Sam Altman has just done one of these, exactly the same right. play as SBF. It's a, it's a Sam coin. So the, the, not a million miles off each other. Oh, it's, okay. You know, but yeah, different Sam. Yeah, sorry. And yeah, he's um, running out ahead, right? And this 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 race going on for technological supremacy in the, in this sort of era. Um, and yeah, we're just going the other way. It's like we're literally going backwards and just turned around and started running the other direction at exactly the worst time. So yeah, the the. The only winning move is to play here. We have to, we have to be technologically progressive. Otherwise, there's a massive shift in power structure coming in the world, right? So. East. Yes, probably 30% of the world jobs will be gone in the next five to 10 years. Um, so you're talking mass unemployment due to automation. So what, what we've just seen today in Salesforce, you're going to start seeing announcements like that all the Will time. Will that not be a temporary thing? And the, and the, and the Delta will be picked up yeah, by I, um, I new, it, new I, jobs. If. Types of. If you're in the race. If you're not in the race. You, so what do you need? Okay. You've okay got, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know for a fact that big consultancy companies, your McKinsey's and various kinds of people are going to companies now and saying, Install generative AI in your company and you'll save 30% cost savings. And it means 30% like workforce reduction, basically. So you're going to start seeing big AI related layoffs. It'll happen in the tech industry first, right? So your likes of Google, Facebook, you know, like Meta, um, they're, they're going to start like sweeping out because they've got the tech, right? They, they're the ones creating it. So it makes sense that they'll use it first. And it just so happens that AIs are really good at coding and, and like, so the engineers, the computer coders and, and, and frankly, you know, Google and Meta, they pay people way too much money. And like, you know, they've got real jolly, easy jobs for like half a million dollars a year and stuff like that. You know, there's like crazy inefficiency because they've had it so good for so long and incredibly bloaty, but now they need the money to pour into AI. Right. So AI is one of these things where you get better at it the more money you literally burn. Right. So it's, it's like you, 
just literally run these GPUs and you can just pile data into it. It's technologically not that difficult. It's just mathematics. It's like there's nothing absolutely that fancy about this. More data, more compute. So we're starting to look at all these people and thinking, actually, I could just buy GPUs with this. And this is an asset that's going to make us money over the next decade, way more than those people are. So we're going to start seeing big labor market restructuring. But okay, you don't necessarily have to fire them, right? You've got 30, you know, your 50,000 man hours you've just saved. You can amazingly just get rid of those people. Or you can say, let's find a new job for these 100 people. Now, if you're an innovative company, you'll be able to do that, right? But it's going to need professional development. It's going to need adult education. It's going to need innovative thinking to find what these new roles are. You know, it requires like, you know, in the UK, we will need to m do massive adult education enterprises. Like everyone's going to have to go back to school basically to do this, right? Um, and we don't have the infrastructure for it. You know, we're not prepared for it. We're not thinking about it. It's um, it's a worrying position to be in. I feel like we're just going completely the opposite direction. We should be running at the technological frontier as hard as we can because it's an opportunity, right? There's we have huge technological we uh, like and knowledge power in this country. We have the best universities in the world. Um, we have the best research centres, we have the best minds in the world, you know, and um, we could, it could be a way for us to get back in the race, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and I'm just not, the, just the, the pulling the funding out of big AI projects now just feels like a, a really bad idea for me. You think we are the best university in the world? Yeah, we, I mean, in... I, I argued this point to someone who's a foreigner who lives in this country and has lived in this country for a long time yeah. and it actually works in a university. Yeah. I say I argued this point. I couldn't argue it. I said, well, we've got the best university in the world. Oxford, Cambridge, and whatever else. And, and one of the points I said was, look at all the Chinese. The Chinese don't come here for no reason. They come here because yeah, yeah. it's great. And the argument I got back was, no, they come here because it's cheaper than the alternatives. This is it one is of the cheapest cheap. places to come it for a Western education. So, in the, if you believe the international league tables, um, I mean, all of the universities are pretty bad, right? You've got the, the. I mean, you speak from experience as a. I, I worked here. in the higher education yeah. sector for many years, right? I was, I left a, I was an associate dean when I finished a director level positions. I, I had a very broad view of the higher education sector. And for a long, yeah, the, our university sector is very strong. Um, our research quality and output is high. Our influence on, on the international stage and in, in sort of research in the top journals, we punch above our weight, actually. But we have a very robust higher education sector. You know, I think we've got like 280 institutions. You know, a bunch of the top ones are in the top league tables. We do compete with Harvard and, you know, Ox the Oxbridge universities do compete with Har Harvard and Yale. And like Harvard has, it's essentially basically more like a hedge fund than a university now. They've got like, you know, $800 billion assets under management or something like that. So compared to the amount of money we've got, the quality of education is very high. Uh, we've had, a, I, when I was teaching, we used to have like split part American students come over and they were like a year below. Like the, I'd bring them as second year students and they were like first year students. So the, mm. the educational quality is, is like, is high. We, we, we have a huge amount of potential. But the problem is, is that we produce about like, you know, 2000 physicists a year. I'm a physicist by background. And one of my crusades for a while was like, we need more physicists, right? It's so like, this is how we get, you know, this is how we get in the space race. It's how we get into AI. You know, it's how we like, it's how we compete in the world. We need more engineers, more mathematicians, more physicists, more STEM graduates. And we produce about 10,000 a year. But it's really tragic. The people, who, like a lot of my physics mates, are in really bad jobs. Like, they're, they're underpaid. You know, they did some of the brightest minds in the world. And they can't find a job that utilizes it. You know, right. so we haven't got the industrial sector that uses high-quality STEM skills. Um, and really, we need to be activating... The, the brain power in the country 
now, right? We need to be like really upping our throughput of like really high quality um, graduates and then finding exceptionally well paid jobs for them to go into afterwards. That's the only way we compete with like the the average salary for an AI researcher at OpenAI is half a million dollars a year. That's the average. Some of them are getting two million dollars a year salaries. So if you're an AI researcher in this country, where do you go? You go and work for OpenAI. Yeah. So we're training them. Our taxpayers are like subsidizing a lot of these things and they're all just going to leave. So yeah, we'll we'll hit a massive brain drain. Anyone who is good will, you know, just get poached. And the the amount of money coming into this stuff is insane. Trillions and trillions of dollars. Can we pull it back to AI crypto a I minute? Mean, yeah. Uh, um, where do you see? So where, where can you see anywhere where there's a convergence of those two that is not obvious, but you can see some, you can see it coming in a particular area, and that is that is that is why one of the reasons you're excited about this. Because to me, you know, you're speaking about AI and crypto earlier. I'm still I, I can see. Okay, yeah, I can see how AI and crypto interact. That'd be fucking amazing. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think about this is pretty much all I think about. Um, largely, so there's a few places where I think it's going to be super interesting. One is this organizational dynamic, which we were talking about. So in decentralized organizations, it's much more chaotic, right? So you can think of the old world organizational paradigm that is... Um, it actually comes through this history of like scientific management, Fordism, so like optimization, hierarchy. So it came into like chains of authority. Fordism, that's optimization. Ford yeah, so you Fordism. Mean you mean referring like to the Henry Ford? Yeah, yeah. So like production lines. I've never heard Fordism, that's all I can Yeah, about. Fordism is like the process of like just literally production line yeah. mechanics. So, um, yeah, so. Scientific management, it was like people found that you could look at an organization and figure out efficiencies by basically like running experiments. Um, like if we give this guy a bigger shovel, he'll shovel more coal. Let's make it a, um, a policy. And then we, we started to build these very mechanized ideas of organizations. Um, and they all come down to like chains of authority. CEO, board level, you know, middle management, you know, you know, managers, lower level managers, workers. It's like a pyramid of power. And decentralized organizations are much less structured like that. You don't have to have all these management layers in the middle because essentially everyone's just turning up to contribute potentially for financial reward. Um, and they're running on more like bounty systems and people are there if they want to. And they might be juggling five or six of these organizations, but they're messy. The complexity is much higher. Um, you don't get to make predictable decisions very easily. Um, you don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow because everyone's just doing whatever they want, basically, you know, and chasing their own incentives. But AI can watch everything, right? So whatever anyone's submitting, you know, there might be, you can imagine like a, a big decentralized organization with like 10,000 people. Everyone's doing all sorts of different stuff. Um, they're all submitting, you know, they're all talking in chat groups. They're all, um, you know, they're all voting. They're all posting new documents. They're shipping new code. They're doing all of this mad stuff in a completely unstructured way. Um, AIs have this ability to have see it all and make sense of it. They're like synthesis engines. So you can literally just say, what's the organization done today? And it will like say, this is what's happened. And I'll summarize it all together. Uh, okay. And you'll be able to, um, mm. and, you, and you can even just say to this thing, now tell it me in Shakespearean, you know, or explain it like I'm five. It oh, can okay. reinterpret all of this information in any way that you see fit. Tell, give it me in Japanese, right? Give it me in Chinese. Give it me in English. Um, or point it, out the inefficiencies. Yeah, yeah, well, it's it. You have this context, like mm. it, AIs eat context and emit information. 
So it can have like huge contextual awareness of the very messiest organizations and can give you ideas of where to go next, right? And, and, um, so just informationally, like one of the, I'm thinking of these as like knowledge organizations now where, um, they, goes back to this, like I literally built one of these organizations many years ago and AI was the missing piece. Because what you have is all these different groups doing all these different things, but integrating it back into the whole organization, very, very difficult. But AI can do it because it has this amazing ability to see everything and synthesize it um, in a way that you want. So you just say, tell me what Bob's been doing for the last week or whatever. Um, and whatever Bob has put in, he'll be, it'll come out, you know? And you'll, so organizationally, AI will be a, an absolute revelation. It will, it will completely change and it may, it will make DAOs work, right? And I actually think it'll be the thing that, um, steps DAOs above centralized organizations because they don't really scale that well. Uh, and they're not very agile. So classic centralized organizations are very rigid, right? You, you will have seen a, in any large organization you've seen, it's like making them move very, very difficult, especially if you've been going in a particular direction for a long time, 10, 15 years or whatever. Um, and they lose their agility as a trade off for being very good at something specific. Um, but in a world that's about to change radically, you know, contextually, you know, things are getting going to start moving around. Everything's going to get more complex, more volatile, more different. Um, organizational agility is like number one priority. Um, so AIs get to unlock this stuff. So the crypto bit is that's how you, who gets to put information in this thing? Um, is gated by tokens, you know, so it, like digital identities that we hold, the blockchain store our history of pro participation in this thing. I can, you know, we can just pump money out to this organization and pay everyone like highly granularly. Um, efficiently, we can pay like we could pay 8 million people in a day with one transaction, essentially. Um, so you can just like mass pay people. You, you'll be able to just the, the combination of these things is going to be very exciting for like really doing radical scale organization. Um, there's a few other bits. There's like, there's some things that worry me a little bit. There's like people. So AI agents, like agentic behavior is when an AI just goes off and starts doing it itself. So when, okay. you, when you talk to chat GPT, you give it a prompt and it gives you a, another response and then you give it a prompt and it, that's called chain of thought. And agents have their own chains of thought. So it goes, okay, I mean, you I give it a job to do. Go and do this for me. And I'll go, okay, I found this. I'm going to try this now. And it goes and does it. Okay, that worked. I'm going to do this. And it just prompts itself, basically. Um, now one of the things, you'll be able to do is like literally give one of these things a treasury of money so it can go and start spending things now. So the AI has a bank account. So it can go and purchase GPU compute. It can go and buy NFTs. It can go buy tokens. It, you know, it can buy anything that's on chain. It can go and make money. Um, and yeah, some of these could become unstoppable. Right. So you can imagine these agents that are like, because of crypto, you can't stop them <laughs> because they're off. Uh, and that's the bit that kind of like concerns me a little bit around these things. And it will happen. There's just like, there's no, basically no stopping it at this point. Mm. Yeah. I was chuckling away there. The, the thought of yeah, giving an AI bank account money. Yeah. And the, the other thing is the art, the art, well, this is the common worry about, probably if we boil it down, one of the common worries people have about AI, um, is, uh, like you said, that chain of thought. Yeah. Here's, here's what I need you to do. Go and do it. And it's the arc it takes. It's the steps it goes to, to achieve that aim. 
Yeah. You know, if the person, if the person issuing the instruction hasn't thought about all of the ways and different ways this could be done, good and bad, yeah, positive or negative, profitable or or not, then uh, it's going to get to the end result and it may maybe a net loss, maybe net negative impact. Yes. You know. Yeah. Um, so that the way that you can do these at the moment, there was like about a year ago, you could build this agent called Auto GPT that was one of the first that you, like. Okay agentic things that you could do with this and it was terrible you know it would derail itself because they hallucinate one of the big limitations of um language models is that they they're like bullshitters right they, what do you mean so the people I, I i don't even think they're intelligent right i think it's a misnomer in itself at the moment right they they don't they're not, um they're probabilistic so it's basically like talking to a talking to an MP3, right? It's like a compression <laughs> thing. So we put trillions of words of text into these things, and you can compress it down to this like file that's like a few gigabytes in size. And what you're essentially doing with a prompt is getting it to access this sort of like graph of of data um semantically so it looks at the words that you're putting in and then charts a path through this thing and then guesses at the best thing that you want it's probabilistic what is the difference between that and human interaction so there's a lot of crossovers right there's <laughs> a, the humans are bullshitters as well right yeah. we um we literally dive into our memory banks and produce what we think is the best response at the time and it's not a million miles off the difference is we have a kind of metacognitive thought where you'll stop yourself saying something absolutely nonsense right because you go oh in a minute because you've got like layers of thought in your head where you can like go actually that doesn't match up you reason right you have what's called extended abstract thought We've got time and that experience of interactions on our side, right? Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you like you we reason in ways that AIs don't. At the that moment. currently isn't documented, so an AI AI an LLM can't wouldn't be able to have they, that information. They don't think in the yeah. traditional sense, yeah. right? What they're doing is just the what what are called probabilistic retrieval mechanisms. They're just guessing and chucking something out and it has no notion of that was the right thing to say or not. It's just said it, right? So agents go spiraling off because it can't say, oh, actually, that's daft. I shouldn't have said that. That, was, that doesn't make any sense. It can't do that bit yet, right? It can't go, hold on a minute, this makes absolutely no rational sense because it, they don't have a world model where they can say, hold on a minute, that's nonsense. But for a single LLM, you know, check, check, check the obvious chat GPT, for example, or take anyone. For a single LLM, that's operational. Um, the more interactions it has with a, with human or humans, the more it learns, uh, in addition, what is right and what is wrong. In the same way that we learn, oh, that's a good thing to do. Or, that's, yes. or hitting my sister around the head is a bad thing to do because my dad won't like it. I'm not going to hit my sister around the head again. Or yes. when I'm asked if I want, uh, X, Y, Z thing, responding with that answer is bad. So as yes. as an LLM exists in that way, chat, I'll use ChatGPT as an example because it's exposed yeah. to millions of people. It has to be, it must be learning and taking that individual it, interaction with me. Yes. Yesterday, whenever it was, and building that into how it responds to other people. Right. That's exactly what it does. Yeah. So it, every time you talk to GPT, you're training it, right? And this is one of the big problems with it because the privacy thing is like you, you know you, you if you're like i when i first started coming out i'd sort of stop myself doing this i was using it to like you know build my business plans and all this sort of stuff and i realized i'm just se sending everything i'm going to do to sam altman basically um and actually there was a few things you know i've created some novel mechanisms that i've give names to right and and i was like let's see if it knows if it's in the database you know i've said it a couple of times online you know and various places said it on Twitter. And it's like, no, I don't know what that thing is, you know? So I explain what it is to the machine. And then 
you know, a, 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 like a month later, I ask it what it is again, and it knows now. It's because I've it I've trained it by feet. So everyone's prompts going into this thing, everyone's conversations. People use this thing for very personal things, right? The, all your deepest, darkest secrets are going into the the you know your AI boyfriends or whatever. Well, that's right? why the companies are banned. Ban, ban, yeah, yeah. Ban it's a because... nightmare. And th- and this is the the thing, right? So <laughs> actually, the next frontier of this thing is you're quite right. The way it moves at the moment, it kind of mimics us. So it listens to thousands of people behaving, or watches thousands and hundreds of thousands of people behaving. And then we'll give you probabilistically the way to behave based on how other people have behaved in the past. So it's not being a person, it's not thinking, it's not reasoning, it's just doing what is most likely to be the best output based on historic data. So where agents are going next is actually what you need to do is watch people work over time. So instead of just a prompt, so let's say I wanted to create a digital HR manager. Like what I want to do is watch a HR manager work over time, right? And how do you do that? Well, you surveil them. And a lot of, um, you know, these AI assistants that people like, I strongly advise people not to install these things on their computers because they're just surveillance systems. Like the, they will, you're giving access to all of your files. They want full visibility of everything they're doing and they want to watch you work, watch how you behave. Uh, and companies will do it. They'll start recording everyone's full system computers, you know, so watch everyone working, which is just training data for AIs. Um, so they can build an agent that will ultimately replace those people. Um, so yeah, the next, it's just all, it's all about the data. So watching people work, watching people behave, um, is the game. And actually one of the things that I think is a huge, like again, huge crypto unlock thing, particularly with DAOs is if you will be able to watch people problem solve, you know, with all this visibility, um, and give them full control over the data that they're sharing to it and pay them for it. So at the moment, like, all of these big AI companies are just stealing everything off the internet. Like every picture that's on Instagram, every post that you put online, everything that touches the internet immediately gets scraped into training data for GPT and Claude and, and, you know, all of these other ones. Um, and so really like these things are good because of us. Right. They've not just, they're not just stealing our data. They've stole all of our ancestors knowledge to, they're good because of the human data that's within them. Um, and their practices at getting this data are like, it's, they just steal all the copyright stuff. It's like, it's just all goes in. Um, so I'm hoping this, this is I, my theory on this is it's just going to get so weird and creepy. That it's finally going to get people to care about privacy. Like mostly people, I've got nothing to hide, you know. I was like, I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't care. Like I've got nothing to hide. Watch me. I don't care. But when you realise that OpenAI is making money out of you by surveilling you, and it knows a creepy amount about, like it'll stop predicting what you're gonna do. You know, have you got a headache? Have you? You know, like I've ordered you some. Um, Neurofen. And you're like, I have. How did you know? You know, it's like that kind of stuff will happen. I'm sure there is a, there is something out there at the moment that will autom- that will automatically order you things based on behaviors and habits oh, yeah. from somewhere. And people, I'm trying to think what it is. There's a few of these things out now. But the, the, I'm just thinking the there. smart fridges do this. Like, there's... oh yes, the smart fridges. Yes, yes yeah. There's... But order your milk. You run out of milk. It's order your milk. Because what? Yeah, there's one like, yeah. yeah, you're out of milk. Wild. Like, yeah, but it'll go way deeper than that. But yeah, I, but I was just thinking that there's, you know, when I was talking there about what's the difference between between that and and human interactions. Now, there's a key difference in the way we, the way an, an AI will learn about how to be more human, how to be act more like what we want they think we want it to be through interactions with us yes we interact with them not in not in the way 
Not in the same way you interact with their children, right? So they can't possibly do any of the same things. Like when I interact with, I think what I'm going to you is like, there's a concern about, oh, will I, you know, will it become so close to you and it's creepy or a problem? Yeah. There's a limitation there, isn't there? Because when I'm interacting with people or children, for example, I'm interacting in a way that I, I want to shape their behavior. Yeah. I want to shape their thought. Yeah. My children, not other people's children, my children, sometimes other people's children, but you know, I don't want my children to behave in a way that's going to bring harm to them. Yeah. And I don't want my children to behave in a way, uh, sorry, I don't want them to think in a way that is going to make them feel sad. You know, I'm yeah. really high level in this. When I interact with chat GPT, I ain't go fuck. Yes. I want the answer. Yeah. I want you to give me an answer. I'm going to give you that information I want you to give me. Yeah. You know, and, and probably if, if chat GPT does something bad or not what I want, I'm not going to respond to chat GPT in the same way I would respond to my kids. I'm not responding in a, yeah. Edu- so much of an educational and a passive way. It's a different kind of way. Yeah, there's going to be, um, yeah, there's slightly concerning with, with anthropomorphizing these things in the sense that we're trying to make them behave like humans when they're not humans. And, um, they're starting to, you know, they're doing this mimicry of us and our human behavior. And yeah, if we're, we're thinking about these systems as being important over time or generating personalities, which is where they're starting to go, you know, um, you know, like Sam Altman released this voice thing that sounded so much like, like Scarlett Scarlet Johansson, um, cause it was, he was trying to create her the, after he'd asked her to do the, do the, yeah, yeah. And so he got someone he sounded like her <laughs> instead and, and she sued him and all that sort of stuff. But largely it's because we're like, trying to turn these things into not being tools but personalities i think that's a mistake actually these things should be seen of seen as tools um and it's going to be important for us to keep this kind of like um like understanding that they're not actually beings we were already down that slippery slope though i don't say you do that you know i have yeah. caught myself sometimes feeling like i should say thanks yeah, the yeah. task oh, of just asking a computer like, to do. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. there's also so there's or, m- or greeting it. Hey, y- yeah, yeah. I'm talking to an algorithm. Yeah, and threatening it works the best. So, if you, <laughs> like, if you <laughs> Go thre- on. no, literally, there's real research on this. If you threaten to fire it, um, it gives you better responses. No one knows why. If you bribe it, if you say like, um, if you do this right, I'll give you five thousand dollars. No, and, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's real research on this. Like, weird, weird, like, imaginary bribes work on it. Threats around, like, if you don't get this right, I'm going to kill these kittens. Oh my god. Makes it perform better above benchmark. <laughs> no one knows why. Right? We don't understand how these systems work because they're emergent. They're just like, what it is, is like. When you're saying it, you're referring to chat GPT. Yeah, yeah well, LLMs GPT. generally. Uh, okay. okay. Um, but yeah, we, we don't actually know how they work at all. Why? Like the, we, we've just getting to the point where there's this research strand called interpretability where we're trying to look inside its mind as it's working to see how it's coming up with this stuff. Mm. But we don't actually know. It's, it's, um, it's a kind of emergent phenomenon. So this is, this drives a lot. There's one of the big narratives is AI safety and there's some real cranks involved in this like narrative and yeah there is some kind of fairly weird group of internet people who um have got themselves into very influential positions over ai companies who have convinced themselves that you know we're going to create a super intelligence that's going to be a thousand times smarter than humans and that's going to happen imminently and um we need to find ways, they call it the alignment problem. Like when this super intelligent being emerges, how do we make sure it's on our side and just doesn't turn us all like into dog food or something as soon as it arrives? Um, and that is a misdirection in my view. Um, and it's, there's like a game of thought where like we were talking about earlier with regarding to regulation in crypto, AI regulation is moving way quicker than crypto 
regulation has. Mm -hmm. It's a bigger game. It's like, you know, largely this is just shitcoiners messing around on the internet. <laughs> Who cares, right? It's a small, you know, it's a small market cap. It's 25% of gold, you know, who cares, right? You know, but AI is, everyone knows this is the big one. So everyone's moving at it quickly. And again, it, the adding all these compliance hops in, you know, the EU AI Act, like if you want to launch an AI that EU citizens will use, you have to make sure it, you know, complies to, to, to these regulations, which means sending all your code to the EU as part of it. So they can say, yes, you can, give, you have to give them all your secrets before, you know, that's part yeah. of the game. But, um, really there's a lot of money gone into this, big players, but, and like I say, they're burning billions of dollars. These models they make, they're going to cost a hundred billion dollars, like by the end of the next year to make these things. Um, they're going to start using big chunks of the world's energy to run. It's a huge, huge, like huge, huge deal. So there's moves to amplify the perceived risk of them, particularly this idea of like super intelligence and runaway like AI god type systems. So that you to bring all this compliance and surveillance into into AI world. And what this is the benefit of this is that only AI open AI and Microsoft and and Google and Meta and all of these players can afford it. Right. The only way that you get players in the game is if you can afford a hundred million dollar a year compliance budget. Um, so this is like regulatory capture, hmm. right? So you can manipulate the rules to your benefit. You can keep the rest of the market out. You can stop your future competitors from turning up from ever existing. Um, and in my view, they're using this existential risk kind of thing as a way of skewing perceived risk of this, when actually the real risk is... One sec. Yep. Sorry. Fuck's sake. Actually run now. Yeah, we've only got, we got a few minutes. One second. Okay, we're just about... Yeah, we've got a few minutes. Anyway... Um, so we're gonna hit stop. Yeah. Uh, so picking back up, uh, existential, they're using the existential risk. Yeah. On the regulation side of things. Sorry, continue. So yeah, the, the kind of game is, um, it's a kind of misdirection game to make us worry about, um, these super intelligent AIs when it, in reality, the real risk of AI is the very near term job losses and companies surveilling their employees to replace them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the actual practice of using AI for corporate and government surveillance and all these sort of things. These are the things that we should be worried about. The ability of using these technologies to be able to understand people at scale and manipulate them and control them. And all that sort of stuff. Um, that's what we need to be worried about. Um, we actually need to be worried about the global power base consolidating around these AI companies. That's why so much money is piling into them is because they're going to be so powerful that they're going to be bigger than nation states. Like already Meta, Google, um, they're already powerful, but more powerful than like 90%. 95% of the countries in the world. So they're like the new superpowers. Um, so the people who control these AIs are going to be monumentally powerful, which again is where the crypto crossover comes in. Because what we need is, is decentralized versions of these. So we need like humans to govern this, not these corporates. So how GPT behaves to you is generated by this like system prompt. Like you can, these have been jailbroken a couple of times where you can give it the right prompts and it just coughs up all its secrets. Um, and it'll go, you know, it, the literally it's just 
a list of natural language instructions, like don't be mean to people, don't say naughty words, don't be racist, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, don't endorse Trump. Yeah, yeah, don't endorse Trump, all of that sort of stuff, right? It, it's like, um, and, you know, the Google Gemini was the hilarious one where they kind of retconned history yeah. on their, like... Did you generation. test that out? I had a look at that. I did yeah, it was hilarious. That. It was like, you know... God's they're sake. just arbitrarily making like history different yeah. for very arbitrary kind of equality and diversity kind of like metrics, right? But really what they're trying to do is actually change history. Yeah. Like they're actually trying to re reshape truth around their vision, right? Around a corporate vision of, of truth and reality. So that's a credibly diff like dangerous position to be in where what what the world perceives as true, it actually is determined by about four or five companies. And um, then, and then throw in your, and then you throw in your nation states, which they already have a significant influence over, and those nation states deploying things like CBDCs, yeah, and the elimination of you know hard cash currency, where you all of a sudden those strings can be pulled, and and uh, you're no longer governed by the government; you're governed by the big corporations, and you're all eating. Flipping insect food. This is it. We, we're, we're, we're seeing this kind of like, literally, the NSA is on the board of directors for OpenAI. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what we're seeing is this like, it's kind of, we started this kind of public-private partnership sort of dynamic where we had like governments teaming up with, you know, big corporates and leveraging their capabilities. And yeah, we're starting to see this like coalescing of power around who, who has the technology, who, who controls the truth. And a big part of these regulations will be, you're not allowed to use open source models. You know, you're not allowed to, you know, not allowed to use crypto, not allowed to use open source models will go hand in hand. Um, when really, the real danger is that these corporations gain way too much power. Um, and literally, their goal is to extract as much value as from humanity as much as possible. It's like literally led legal remit. If they don't maximize shareholder value, they're breaking the law, hmm. right? They're actually being negligent. And, you know, so there, we have to, you know, kill all these jobs. You know, we have to, you know, do all these things to get as much money out of people. We have to micro target people adverts because if we didn't, we wouldn't be maximizing shareholder value. So really, AI needs to be decentralized. Um, it needs to be democratic. So if there's an AI, we can imagine a UK AI model, for example, the perfect one would be literally a democracy, like how it behaved, you know, what words it says and what it doesn't say, or what its personality was, what, like, what it considered like truth. This should all be debated in public forum. It shouldn't be six people on a board deciding what truth is. Um, so yeah, actually, like since we've last spoke, I've now realized DAOs is the way to do this, right? Is to, um, put these, like the, actually the perfect thing for a DAO to govern is an AI model and its data. So, um, why is that? Sorry. Why? Um, because it's a purely digital thing, for one. So, like, DAOs have got into all of this, like, messy business of trying to plug into the real world, you know, and, like, trying to own property and, 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 like, doing things like the charity things. And a lot of them sort of failed because they're trying to plug this emerging digital object, like, digital structure into the old world. And the two are rather incompatible at this point, right? And, and consequently, they kind of fail. So, um, one of the lowest hanging fruits for DAOs is like a purely digital enterprise. And AIs are one of these things, right? You can just literally pour data in the pot and you can commercialize it. Um, so one of the things we want to do with this London voice thing is just get Londoners to talk about London and what they care about. And that's valuable data. And, uh, yeah. and perhaps London coin might be how you access this AI to figure out you know, access this database, mm. uh, access this AI. And then how that AI behaves, we can give it its own voice. We can give it its own personality. 
um we can give it our ideas you know and and like how it behaves and um all of that stuff can be governed by a democratic vote um and a big part of this is like okay let's say we've got london voice talking to some guys in dublin about doing dublin voice um we can do manchester voice and 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 then these agents can talk to each other so you can you can get to these um a, a lot of the agent ex- things exciting about ai agents is ai ai agents just communicating with one another to swap information and reach consensus so how is how do the people of dublin and how are the people of london differ and how are they similar these agents will figure that out for what purpose um for reaching consensus and um, like um so yeah this is a really good good question so what what's the purpose at the moment this is a kind of proof of concept idea right deliberating similarities and differences and sharing information is one of the key things right so um we've got this problem we've got this problem as well it's a universal problem between you know manchester dublin and and london um so that means it needs investment right we've discovered signal or a shared problem that we can work on together now right we're just like re- reaching uh consensus and understanding of each other is is the first step but where i want to take it next is going beyond just like location based um models into um domain specific models so it's like a physicist LLM and we get physicists to join this community and deliberate the latest physics you know uh, problems and then all you'll need to do is talk to the physics agent to find out what the physicists think about this thing right so what you're going to be able to do is query millions of people at once it's not it's like the hybridization of human and ai intelligence um so what i think is one of the biggest problems in the world again radical change coming we need high context knowledge ais are going to unlock huge change in the world one of which is a complete derealization of factual knowledge right we don't we're changing history um they are misinformation generators um the image models are so good you can create like full video minutes of it you know give me a image of donald there was a recent one of donald donald trump and obama like doing a um like a a a, a convenience store robbery and you all have like walk in with like ak-47s i didn't see that i saw him and kamala harris kissing this morning yeah yeah, yeah exactly so yeah. The, the, these things look real right there's there's yeah. nothing so in that context you're going to have to collect intelligence you're going to have to like pool all everyone's minds to figure out what's real and what isn't um so like a massive deliberation of factual reality is is what i think um we need to get to and for that we need to find a collaborative relationship between human and ai rather than corporate ai extracting as much value from humanity as possible um we need humans to control ai um because ultimately we we're starting to look at these technologies like like um this corporate is the the thing that controls these things when actually ai is just mathematics it's like right now there's a civilization somewhere in the universe discovering ai exactly the same time as us right this is universal this is like there's nothing that special this is not a sam altman discovery it's a human discovery um it's just mathematics it's like cryptography and ai are just numbers and numbers are the same for everyone in the universe um and so yeah it's a universal thing it's like a it's a human discovery um and yeah we need to make sure that it's under human control otherwise um we're going to give all the power to literally a handful of corporate players who just want as much money as possible. How do people follow what you're doing? Um 
Yeah, it's a good question, actually. You can, if you look on X, I'm about to sort of diversify a little bit on, um, you will have found a kind of cypherpunk looking character on Twitter. I'm going to sort of rebrand to Nick Almond. You'll be able to just search Nick Almond okay. on, uh, Could you just Dr. On, Nick on there at the moment? I'm you? Dr. Nick on yeah, there yeah. at the moment. I'm thinking I'm going to, Give out slightly less threatening aura with me <laughs> and just put my real face up. Be, and, and part of that is because of like, um, the problems I'm sort of getting into are a bit less 100% crypto focused and more, more coming into AI and like yeah. societal sort of like interactions with these things. So, um, yeah, find me on X, uh, Dr. Nick, um, Dr. Nick A or Nick Helmond. Uh, you can find Factory Down. On there, Fact Dow, um, on X, um, and our company is called Factory Labs, uh, FactoryLabs.org, and you'll find a little bit about London Voice on there. And if you're a Londoner, um, you'll be able to come and get involved in that. We're going to start running these meetings where we can introduce people to these technologies. And so you have to live in London. Um, we're using Londoner. Listen, I the... want to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're, you're basically a Londoner. Um, and this is it, right? It's like you, you live and work in London. You are a Londoner, right? We're, we're in London now. Um, so yeah, we're pretty broad brush on it. We're just making sure that everyone's kind of a human at the moment. Um, cause it's essentially like a polling thing, right? We're just trying to like sense make what people care about. Um, and any of these data sets that, um, start to become even remotely interesting or valuable, we'll get botted and attacked. So we're largely just doing this to be making sure people are real at this point. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Always yeah, a pleasure. Enjoyed it, mate. Yeah, another learning experience for me. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, I'll definitely, I, I'll definitely get along and see see how things. Uh, I don't live in London. I live just outside, but I'll definitely come along and see yeah. uh, see how you're doing things. Very well, and man. I know you've got uh, X spaces to run to now. X spaces sounds weird, doesn't it? Doesn't I still call it X Twitter. spaces? It's still, yeah, it's still Twitter, yeah. Man, man. Twitter spaces to run to now. Um, but no, cool. Good luck with it, mate. Sounds great. And thanks. Catch you on the next one. Yeah, absolutely. After the next rug pull, I'll be like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next time crypto blows up. <laughs>